I want to thank everyone for joining us today as we have a panel discussion about emergency communication lessons that were gleaned during the COVID-19 epidemic earlier this year and best practices for improvement. Uh, my name is Brandon Daniel. I'm the co-founder of Dialogue Health. Uh, and it is my great pleasure to have two panelists here with me that can speak to specific uh, lessons that they've learned both in their uh, with their organizations and with their day jobs. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Chris Krolik. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Chris Krolik, and I'm a uh, center administrator with AmSurge uh, in the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area I'm in the suburb north of Dallas. Um, over one center right now and about to open up a second center uh, currently. Thank you, Chris, for joining today. And, and Serena Pettis from, uh, from Lovelace in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Hello, my name is Serena Pettis and I'm the uh, Vice President of Marketing and Business Development for Lovelace Health System in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Thank you for having us. All right, guys, let's, uh, before we get into the lessons you've learned, I thought it would uh, be helpful to have a quick conversation about the current state uh, of this emergency. Obviously, we're doing a, a recorded webinar today because it's become very difficult for people to meet in person. And as we're recording this, we're at a state, unfortunately, where we're seeing daily COVID test results of over 100,000 cases. We're seeing infection rates in some states hitting their highest levels since the pandemic starts. Uh, I've seen news headlines today about hospitals, uh, ICU beds, and staffing levels being stressed and stretched. Uh, and I see some people beginning to talk about shutdowns and, and you know, looking at stopping elective surgeries and any non-urgent stuff. And then coupled with all that, bearing in mind I just got my flu shot, we're staring down at, a, at another pandemic, which is the, the traditional winter flu season. Uh, you know, having gone through this in the in the spring, we're now looking at a second wave, and, and that sets up for some, some real challenges. So uh, Serena and Chris, um, you know, in your day jobs, both of you have to have emergency communication plans in place. So I thought I might ask, start the conversation by asking you maybe to, to comment on the importance of these crisis communication plans as you see it. Absolutely. So yes, you're absolutely right. We have to have those communication plans in place, especially for a hospital and clinic where we have um, patients who need to get information, as well as employees who need to get information in a timely manner. But as you all know, those are, are plans that we didn't necessarily think we'd have to use or that may or may not get updated very frequently. So it was it was a race to, to dust those off and get them into place and, and get some protocols and, and processes into place on how to get that timely communication out. Yeah, absolutely. Agree with Serena there and in, in trying to make sure that all of our staff and patients were updated, um, especially at the beginning of this, uh, the COVID crisis, as regulations changed daily, sometimes even hourly from the CDC as far as recommendations that they were giving us. And so making sure that was communicated to our patients and our staff um, to keep everyone safe at the center, um, even whenever we were not doing elective procedures, but we were still do, able to do urgent procedures during that time. Um, just making sure keeping everyone safe. The uh, was was your information? Well, I guess was your emergency uh, communication plan? Was that something you regularly reviewed as an organization every year? Uh, was it ever evolving? I think for us at Loveless, we work very closely with our partners within the Ardent Health Services. So Ardent owns um, a number of other hospitals across. The country and we work very closely with them on these um, communication plans including crisis communication plans I would say we update them annually but unfortunately in those plans was never a texting platform for us to use in the past so when one became available for us to implement within Ardent I, it was just something that we felt was very valuable for us because as Chris mentioned things are changing so frequently and we needed to get that information out timely. Yeah, and at AmSurge, we had the, the same policy of a yearly review of our disaster plans um, and going over how that communication would work out. Of course, part of our disaster plan, um, you know, a pandemic wasn't necessarily 
that high up on our list of something that we had really been looking at or preparing for at that point. You know, in our, our uh, vulnerability assessment, it doesn't really rank that high previous to COVID. Um, but of course, that's all changed, and, and we had to look at that a little bit differently now. But luckily, we already did actually have um, the Dialogue Health platform in place at our center um, and uh, was able to sort of utilize it in just a different manner than what we were or in an additional way by communicating some of these changes to our patients and staff. Okay. You know, one thing I've heard time and again from people during this crisis is that they realized that emergency communication was about communicating to their stakeholders and they may have started with one target that could be patients or staff, but then they realized that given all of the challenges with COVID and all of the moving, changing regulations and guidelines, that the, the audience was actually quite broad. Could you guys take a second and speak to, you know, how you've looked at emergency communication with respect to your audience during this, this pandemic? Sure. I think for us, we, we focused first um, because we were new to the Dialogue Health platform and it was new to us to launch. We started with staff and we said they are kind of our number one priority at this particular point in making sure that we get timely communication out to them because, again, all of these processes and protocols were changing. We needed to also make sure that they were being notified accordingly to what our new visitor policies were, how they could then communicate right. that to staff, what we were going to do to ensure that patients still continue to get timely care and did not delay their care, making sure that our staff knew that they were going to get temperature checks and, and, how, what, and what we were going to be doing to keep them healthy and safe. And once we kind of did that, we moved into the patient realm and we realized that was our, our second phase, if you will, of of those we wanted to make sure we reached out to. Again, to make sure they were aware what we were gonna do to keep them safe in our clinics and in our mm -hmm. hospitals, making sure that they did not delay care and that they were aware of what they were going to expect once they arrived at their physician visit or at the hospital. Okay, Chris? Yeah, I, I agree with you there. And, and you know, with us, we were already using that the, the platform um, to notify our patients about what to expect prior to arriving pre-COVID um, as far as um, arrival times and, and that type of thing. What we did focus on then at that point was more what their expectations for arriving of the screening that is going to occur, um, that there's no visitors, no family to please allow them to stay in the car. Right. Um, and then also to give that reassurance to our patients that, you know, what all are we doing at our center to keep them safe and make sure that they're informed about what we're doing on our end um, so that they had to sort of alleviate any of those worries about them coming during during the pandemic to still receive procedures that were necessary for them. Um, and then along with that, we started using it more for staff. Previous to COVID, we really weren't using it for our staff. Um, and then we realized that this was a great tool for us to be able to, um, one, update our staff about any changes, but then also give inspirational and reassuring messages to our staff as well during that time, especially whenever we weren't operating at full capacity. And I wasn't able to see a lot of my staff during that time because they weren't able to work. We were only open right. one day, uh, one day a week and only doing 10% of our normal uh, cases. So it was an opportunity for us to be able to reach out to them, make sure that they knew that we were still thinking about them, that we cared about them um, and, you know, give them the resources also they needed for, for instance, like a, a employee assistant programs and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, well, I think, Chris, you that's a great segue into, I think, one of the key lessons that we collectively have all talked about, uh, you know, which is how do you address the vulnerabilities that occur when you don't have the in-person communication taking place? You know, the inability to meet with your staff, uh, in, in, you know, in the cafeteria or in a meeting or the ability to talk to your patients and their family member when they're inside your facility. So, uh, you know, I think that um, that was one lesson I've heard both of you speak about, you know, is how do you, uh, you know, how do you, how do you enable communication outside of your four walls? How do you get information to people? And then how do you even, in some cases, allow them to ask questions, right? And that was something that I think COVID really strained and put put a lot of stress on, which was, you know, that vulnerability of, of not having the interaction on a day-to-day -day basis in real time with, you know, person to person. So. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Right. 
I would say too, Brandon, along with, and I'm sure everybody can agree, you know, these are all things I know I can speak for myself at Loveless that we wanted to do. You know, we wanted to be able to text. We wanted to be able to offer telehealth visits and video visits and, you know, even have meetings in a variety of different ways and have these hybrid models where some staff can work from home and some staff can work in the office. And how can we still remain connected with our leaders and with our caregivers and with our patients and, and employees? And that's through a variety of different ways, such as, you know, teams and WebExes and webinars. And it's it's funny how our our country has evolved to now all of a sudden we can do those things. And all of a sudden, I think we feel more connected to one another, even though we can't yeah. be in front of each other. We're also doing a lot of things we never did before. And we're also now able to accomplish things we never did. So aside from just being able to educate, you know, staff and employees and, and, and our patients about masking and social distancing and how to wash your hands, to Chris's point, we're able to connect with them on, guys, here's our employee survey, or we've got healthcare week is coming up, or we want to recognize you with, with inspirational messages, because it was a, a dark time for the staff. And, and even now they're feeling that, that COVID fatigue. So how can we stay connected with them? Right. Um, so I think our, our whole world has evolved in how we can better communicate, I feel. And, and we get that reassurance that it's getting done through text messages. We always have our phones with us at all times now, and especially as caregivers, <laughs> nurses and doctors, they don't go anywhere without their phones. And then patients, oh I gosh. mean, we're just, we've got these things tied to our hips, so let's use them. <laughs> uh, I freak out. I freak out if I can't find my phone. I'm quasi worried if I can't find my wallet. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I think you raise a good point. I've worked with both of you guys for a while. And to be honest with you, prior to the pandemic, I didn't know what either of you, who, what you look like. You Now we're doing video conference calls and it almost seems more human. You know, it's nice. So, yeah. uh, so. Chris, anything to add on that point about the yeah, vulnerabilities with, really, really, really with, uh, well, and with what you were saying that, you know, all of a sudden it, our, our world was turned, turned upside down and everyone that we were able to, normally see on a regular basis it just changed everything i was actually just talking um earlier today about how because i'm looking to hire some more staff right now the interview process just so different now you know we're so used yep. to you know and just the way the business is done um with our vendors and, and and whatnot is meeting in person shaking a hand and and having that personal interaction and it, we've had to sort of change that but to to um agree with you guys i think that a lot of my support staff that i have corporately um, at my fingertips, I've been able to talk to a lot more, met a lot more people during this time as well, mm -hmm. and some faces to names that I had never had before either, so. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, I think that's, I think that's a, a positive side of this, oddly enough. Um, you know, one thing we talk about at Dialogue Health a lot is, you know, analyzing your communication methods um, and seeing if there are any weaknesses in there. And one thing we often find is, enterprises rely on existing channels of communication without putting much thought into what might be the preference of communication for their audience can you guys speak to what you've seen with phone and email and other channels of communication that were part of your emergency response solution and how you know how this pandemic has forced you to evolve uh, technology i think with that, um, to Serena's point and, and what you said too, is that you know we carry our phones at all times. It's the easiest way to get a hold of anybody at, at any point. The other nice thing with texting is is that it allows them to see the message without necessarily having to pick up the phone. Um, with the number of spam calls that we get now, scam calls that are out there, a lot of people don't pick up the phone if they don't recognize the number. And I can guarantee you most of my patients don't recognize our center's number if we're calling them from that. So right. this allows them to get a, a text saying, you know, that, you know, you have a, a message from Digestive Health Center of Plano, and they're able to respond to that. And they're going to be more responsive right. to that at that point, because they know who's, who's sending this message to them. Right. Yeah. And I'd say to expand on, on what Chris is saying, Brandon, is for us as well, it's forced us to become, I think, more creative about how we... Yeah 
how we send out yep. a message and what we put in that message because it's not like an email or a newsletter where we can go on and on and on and on and on. We we have to keep it brief and simple and there's only so many characters we can put in a text. So it's forced us <laughs> to kind of be creative and and utilize those text messages in a way that again gets that information out in a timely manner. I, we were seeing a lot of patients, for example, in our maternity um, with our maternity uh, OB patients who were either delaying care or questioning whether it was safe to come in. So just being able to include that specific group, our labor of love patients, and yep. notifying them of the safety of delivering and still making sure that they understood they could have a safe, comfortable delivery, um, I think was reassuring for them. And then on the flip side, also being able to utilize um, texting on an infinite command perspective where you know we were having a lot more regulators in our hospitals and on site and being able to let employees know um, who's on site today and why they're on site was really I think good for them to know especially we also had a snowstorm come up so it was great that this platform was in place to educate them on that yep. some of our clinics were going to be on a delay so I think just it snowballs into being creative figuring out different ways in which we can we can still stay connected um but but doing so in a way that really is impactful for them uh, i think that's key i think you know, communication needs to notify people of things educate people support people and where possible even steer them to more information right yeah. and i think that in the case for both of you i've heard it with so many healthcare entities where their patient population is kind of frozen everyone's scared they don't know if it's safe and so the ability to to with reliability know that your message is received because what we've seen in previous issues hurricane harvey was a classic example where clients were putting information up on their Facebook page. I don't know about you, but in emergencies, I don't log into Facebook, you know, or check Twitter, right? I'm I'm making sure my phone is charged is what I'm doing, right? So, um, so can you take a second and maybe just talk about that the, that notion of, you know, ha having confidence that your message is getting to your audience, it's being received, and that they can act upon it. Absolutely. So I think with, you know, the ability of one read receipts and then and then also the ability of two way messaging um, and with that two way messaging as well to be able to. Adjust what you want to say back, depending on what their response is, if they say yes to um, the question that you're asking, you may give them certain information. If you they say no, you would give them something else. Um, and so the read receipts to make sure that they are seeing that. And then for us in our situation for um, COVID follow-ups after our patients leave, we're doing seven and 14 day follow-ups and it allows them to be able to say yes or no, have you tested positive or had right. symptoms of COVID since you've been at our center? Um, and then if so, that further prompt of, well, when and where did you get tested? Right. Um, and then it allows us then to either ask even more clarifying questions ourselves that we can you know, type in ourselves to be able to ask them, or at least it allows me to be able to give them a phone call and, and clarify a little bit more. So it's been um, very important to make sure that those messages are received um, and uh, and making sure that you know that communication basically close that loop of communication. Right, it's crucial. And I, Serena, I, I yeah, I would definitely agree. I think there's there's a time and place for every type of communication. No one communication mm -hmm. is right or wrong or or necessarily better than the other i think it just depends on what it is you're trying to communicate but i will say in this instance the texting has been great in that you can see how many you can run reports of how many um people are are opting in opting out mm -hmm. um versus email it's definitely i think a lower rate of opens with email because people don't exactly know what they're opening or again it's too long of a message or they're just not reading it in a timely manner so i think to have those reports at our fingertips um where we know the success rate is is just key yeah it enables you to react and respond and engage based on who who you know is not getting the information or who has gotten the information and has indicated they need additional engagement. Um, yeah. Let me ask you, uh, so one thing that struck me, uh, I think struck all of us as we're all working from home, 
now uh, it's a lot is that, you know, most people, when they think of emergencies, think of a, a short term finite event, uh, uh, you know, uh, a hurricane, a snowstorm, power outage, you know, and therefore, I think a lot of people, when they think of the emergency communication plans, think of something that, okay, we're going to be able to handle this. We're ready to handle it, you know, before it happens, the storm's coming, we're going to communicate. Speak to me a little bit about what COVID taught you around the importance of being able to communicate, you know, not only before, but in the, I guess in this case, really during the process and then coming out of this, which eventually we are going to come out of this pandemic, you know, the communication is not going to stop because there's going to be some, some lasting changes in behavior. Uh, with respect to all of us, correct, on how we interact with our healthcare facilities. So can you take a second and just maybe let me know, you know, the, what you've learned because of COVID when it comes to the communication throughout the journey? Yeah, I, I think for us here in New Mexico, um, our governor was putting in restrictions, as was the CDC, so it was important, I think, to to share those messages again not just with our employees but also our patients and you're absolutely right things are changing we're we're evolving things were intense in march and then they kind of died down but we were still in this mm -hmm. maintenance phase um so it was still important to get those types of messages such as we're we're safe um we're here for you the cleanliness of our facilities not delaying care but then now it's kind of shifted back to Again, I think we're all seeing that COVID fatigue where people are getting a little bit more yeah. relaxed with the social distancing yep. and their masks and they're tired. I mean, this has been, gosh, we're going on nearly a year and I think people are just tired and just really making sure that we're re-engaging with them um, on those delays of, of surgeries or rescheduled or making sure that they know that we're caring for the most vulnerable right now. New Mexico is very rural, so a lot of um, hospitals across the state transfer patients in for higher level of care to Albuquerque. So we want we want the community to know that we're working with all these different hospitals. Um, and then just keeping that morale up, like Chris said, I, I think it's just yeah. so important that we, you know, things have died down. The media kind of has kind of stopped talking about these healthcare heroes and people have kind of stopped delivering food and supplies and hanging banners has kind of decreased. So making sure that we're still sending those messages of our appreciation right. to the team because we don't want them to lose that steam. Right. Chris, anything to add? Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with what Serena was saying and, and especially right now with, um, you know, us still in the middle of this pandemic, but we're still ramped back up and, and as, as we need to be, because, you know, for, for me, my, my specialty for my center is, is endoscopy. And so, you know, we're, we're able to perform crucial colon screenings for these patients. And if we eliminate right. these, um, you know, the elective procedures, there's going to be tons of uh, colon cancers that are not, um, that are not going to be diagnosed. And so with that though, is that always giving that reassurance to the patients and being able to again constantly reassure our patients and our staff that what we're doing is what's best for our community um, and we're still able to do this in a safe manner yeah I, I think both of you hit upon a key word which is you know communicating the support um, I remember in March uh, in the in, right when everything locked down the, in the country both of you were sending inspirational quotes to your staff nothing about it relevant to care, literally inspiring them, you know, telling them you believe in them, reminding them that they are, you know, heroes. And I just found that to be so inspiring. And, and I, I, you know, have you found your staff to be receptive to being, you know, encouraged via, 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 you know, your communication methods? Absolutely. Um, you know, during that time, we actually were able to retain, even though a lot of our staff was not working um, their full hours. Between that um, and then us, the, the, you know, the, the constant communication with those that were not here as well, we were able to retain 100% of our staff during the COVID crisis initially. Wow! Um, Congratulations. So I think that really helped, and that 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 touch really helped um, to to let them know that yeah, we were here for them, and that we really care about them, and that we will continue to be here for them as well. I agree uh, completely. I think that's that's very important. And 
the way I know it's working is because we've had other people tell us, hey, maybe you can send this out on the app, like stuff that people would never come to us before. <laughs> or they say, I, I know they'll read it if it comes on the app. So can we remind the, the staff about the employee survey coming up or, <laughs> you know, what? <laughs> don't forget to get your flu shot. And they're like, let's make sure we get it on the app. And, and I'll be in meetings with people. And they're like, oh, we just got, you know, a text. I just love these. And so that's really <laughs> nice for us because... Typically, um, you know, we've got to communicate, like I said, in several different ways in order to reach all the employees we have in all of our hospitals across the country. So <laughs> I, love, I love it. People and want to piggyback on your success. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I think it's easy to forget sometimes how much just a very short text to the staff also of, of some reassuring or inspirational words means to them, um, you know. Um, I know my, my staff really did appreciate it, so it's just something to think about. Um, you know, even just with daily communication as well with with, with the staff is um, it's easy to get bogged down into the um, the management side of how are we going to manage this crisis from a financial um, you know supply you know and logistics side, but then make sure that we're keeping our uh, staff in mind as well and their well being. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think. You know, you, you lead and it's important to invest in people's emotional well-being because your staff are, are obviously professionally trained. They know what they're doing clinically, but we're all human beings, right? And it could be, we all know what the scenes were in New York in the spring when you saw people, staff just, you know, uh, just basically exhausted. So, um, well, uh, before we summarize, and again, I want to thank you all for your time today. You know, we've talked about five key lessons that you've taken away uh, from emergency communication because of COVID as it kicked off in March and it's run through the summer and now into the fall. And those were, you know, you've got to address vulnerabilities that occur when you cannot communicate in person. So whether that be a patient or a family member or an employee, uh, you know, you need to address any potential communication weaknesses in your plan. You know, do you have all of the technology options available to you? Uh, I think it's dangerous. One lesson is never assume the message has been received. You know, you want to have as much certainty in your communication channels as possible. Um, you also need to make sure that you're ready for the event, during the event, and then also after whatever emergency occurs. And then lastly, we talked about the the value of, of using your communication plan to support your staff, which are really the backbone of your organization. All that brings me to kind of the, the, you know, the big question in the room, which is, you know, what are y'all doing right now as we stare down uh, what is looking like a pretty significant second wave of COVID and we're heading into winter and we're heading into flu season, you know, what are you doing now that you've, that's different or, or what are you going to continue to do? And is there any lessons that you'd like to add to the conversation? to share, you know, for anybody that's listening to this, to this, uh, this uh, discussion. I think for us, and, and you, you said it, Brandon, is what, where were the gaps? And I think for us, we honestly, when we created our crisis plan, I don't know that we knew texting was a gap before we didn't have it. You know, you don't know how great something is until you, you know, you didn't miss it because you didn't have it. But now that we have it, I can't even imagine getting through this without it. Because a couple years ago, we we changed to a we got a new electronic medical record, and that was just, you know, I thought back then that was a crisis <laughs> or a potential one. But uh, you know, it's funny how 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 difficult it was to communicate all the changes that happened with an electronic medical record. So then, much less right. coming into this pandemic and just knowing we've got an additional tool in which to communicate and, and, and in a more timely manner, I think was great for us. Lessons learned for us would be to just make sure that we continue getting a better understanding of what's relevant for people, what's important, what right. do they want to know. That's just a constant for us, which I think collaborating with other hospitals on messaging, I think is great for us. Like being able to see what Chris was doing um, with those inspirational messages mm -hmm. was, was great for us. I don't know that I ever would have thought to do that. And so just being able to collaborate, I think is a lesson learned for us. And, you know, so for us to continue being successful. Okay. Thank you. Chris, what about yourself? 
So, you know, I think at the beginning of, of the pandemic, um, you know, it was sort of like, you know, we were, we were building the plane as we were flying it, um, you know, and, and we we're just trying to figure it out as we went along. And luckily, again, we had some, we already um, had the Dialogue Health platform and we were able to easily um, sort of include some new things with that. So communication wise, luckily, we were able to adapt pretty easily and quickly to the, to the needs of, of our center and our patients. Um, so, what, but with this, we're, we're continuing with robust communication at this point with our patients, and just like like Serena said, is what what information is important? What are we what are they needing to know, and what do they need to hear? Um, whether it be you know our patients or our um, our staff members, um, and then just other things is of course you know completely look through our, our emergency um, our disaster and emergency preparedness binder. Um, to to reevaluate, you know, where do we have everything prioritized correctly, and do we have the communication um, in place for any of these disasters, and how could we communicate for any of these other disasters that we maybe have not thought about? How would we communicate for for certain things at that point? Um, and then, of right. course, you know, we we because it's COVID um, emergency or emerging infectious disease binder as well of, of making sure that we have all the resources available for um, ourselves and our staff as well to, to be able to handle something like this, which also, again, includes communication plans for them. Awesome. Well, guys, I have to say it's been an honor talking with both of you today. Your, your leadership and your passion for, you know, for, for supporting your, your audience in both your organizations is inspiring. Uh, and I know uh, you guys have both said you're more than willing to talk to anybody who may have heard this uh, webinar and want to talk to you about some additional best practice. So I've shared uh, your email address on the screen here, but um, thank you for your time. Is there anything you would like to say in closing um, today? And if not, uh, again, I, I wish you utmost safety and well-being during the, the winter and look forward to, uh, to, to being a part of your emergency communication plan as we go forward. So Serena, anything thank you'd like you. to say? Thank no, you. thank you for Chris. including me. This has been great. Thank oh, you. My pleasure. It's been an honor. Thanks for. Thanks, Brandon. And yeah, no, it's, it's been great to uh, talk with you guys today. So. Okay. Well, Godspeed. Stay safe and and have a and we'll we'll talk shortly. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. You as thank well. You.